3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Wednesday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. Um, If you'd like to be part of the program, we'd love to hear from you. The number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. And we can always uh, take your email. That email address is openline at EWTN.com. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your uh, call screener is Charles Beery for about five minutes, and then Matt Gubensky will return to his post. And uh, Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program and our host is he is every wednesday father mitch Paqua. how are you fine you talking about saint herman of alaska no not saint herman of alaska this is a older saint herman uh, uh somebody asked about the origin of the uh hymn uh hail holy queen and it was by a blessed herman about a thousand years ago and that was one of the emails. Yeah, that everything we have. here is about a Russian who yes. was in Alaska. Right. No, not that if one. If I stumble across it, I'll let you know. Okay. But it is All Saints Day. It is All Saints Day, and we want to uh, we, we honor the saints. Uh, I j- just want to make a couple of things before we get to a couple of emails here. Um, first, uh, th- it's uh, fascinating to me how for the last month, uh, all this Halloween stuff, even on you know the uh, classic movie channel, it's all horror movies. It drives me nuts. And I think uh, that a couple things we should note is that people are fascinated with death but don't want to gain deep wisdom about it. And so a lot of these superficialities show up including uh, uh, the, the prominence of vampires and uh, the, um, who are the people that are the walking dead? What do they call those? Zombies. Zombies, zombies. Uh, it's very interesting to note that in both of those cases, it is... It's su- Herman Contractus. That's it, Herman Contractus, and he wrote that hymn. Yes, just so we can answer that. Um, there, it's actually Blessed Herman. Yeah, Blessed Herman, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it, what's interesting, too, is he was blind. He was unable to see, but he wrote a hymn that has lasted for a thousand years. That's pretty good. Um, but anyway, you know, with, with zombies and uh, vampires, it's important to note that these are uh, anti. Christ representations that in the case of zombies these are people that come back from the dead but unlike Jesus Christ who rose gloriously from the dead these are hideous they're ugly and they eat your flesh in order to live while Jesus Christ gives us his body to eat so that we can live Vampires are the same way. They are also back from the grave. They come out when there's moon, full moon, all that stuff. But they only come out at night. They're not part of the day. And they drink your blood as opposed to Christ who gives us his blood. This not is a coincidence, I'm guessing. What's that? Not a coincidence, I'm guessing. I'm guessing not either. And I think... To, to recognize these are the anti-Christ representations of life after death, and they 
take from you in order to make you like them instead of Christ giving himself in order to make you like him. That's a basic choice that all of us have to have. I never thought about this. This is this is very, very insightful Thank for me you. anyway. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's something that has just struck me as I've seen more and more of all this nonsense. Um, secondly, tomorrow is the Feast of All Saints. But what you are going to hear a lot about is the Day of the Dead. They translate the Spanish expression, Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, and they uh, want to promote these images that emphasize death. It's skulls, skeletons, things like that. That's not the purpose of tomorrow. Tomorrow is to pray for the souls of those who have died and are suffering in purgatory. This is the church suffering. And we pray. I know Susan Tassoni has a wonderful new book for children about uh, purgatory. Meeting the Holy Souls, your friends for eternity. Exactly. And she has in there, one of the reasons I want to recommend it, it's not only a, a good picture book for kids to understand about death and about praying for the dead, but some of her explanations are actually pretty good for a lot of adults. In fact, there's a couple seminaries I think that would benefit from reading what she wrote because uh, it's neglected uh, in many places, and even in Catholic circles. Uh, the way that this Day of the Dead is taken, it's not only with images of uh, skeletons and uh, skulls, but there's a decorating with that uh, a, a morbid look at death instead of praying for the souls who are suffering. I think it's also worth noting that the cartels, the drug cartels, worship Santa Muerte, holy death. They promote that because they are a death-dealing aspect of society. So they worship death. That's their deity. That's what they look to for their power, etc. And we always have to remember, it's not promoting death. Death is God's enemy. Read 1 Corinthians 15 to see that. But rather, we pray for those who have died because we want them to see the fullness of God. Again, as Susan Tassoni brings out, at the judge, when a person is judged, they see Christ and then they can't see him until they're purified. And that longing for Christ is part of that purification. This is a good thing for all of us to, to deal with. New Friends Now and Forever, A Story About the Holy Souls by Susan Tassoni that Father Mitch referenced is available at EWTN's religious catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. Right. And then I have another question. And this is kind of related given uh, the, what, ha- what they did. Do Hamas and other Islamic terrorists actually believe they're doing good by killing people? And will God excuse them for their ignorance? A, Hamas and other terrorists do think they're doing good. And uh, they're, they're looking for their own political power. And remember, the three leaders of Hamas together their wealth is valued at about $13 billion. These are very wealthy people who are instigating this war, killing people horribly, I mean, with, you know, beheading their own people. Well, I was going to say that first they instigate this by killing Israelis who were unarmed and unprepared, not at war. And then they killed uh, children, women, which is, by the way, against Sharia law. Islam does not allow you to do that. And that's very important to understand. So, A, they are contradicting, they're doing terror in the name of Islam, but contradicting Islamic law. Even by their own values, God will not hold them to account. Secondly, they 
are using their own people as shields to protect themselves from attack and innocent uh, people in the Gaza Strip are being killed as the Israelis hunt for Hamas. Yeah, they're, 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 I heard someone make a nuance earlier this week. Yes. They're not using them as human shields. They're using them as targets. Yes. And I think for us to remember that that is also evil by their own standards, let alone God's standards. The end does not justify the evil means you do to get it. DWTN's Open Line Wednesday with Father Mitch Pacwa. Here's a thought from Mother Angelica's perpetual calendar. We should not aim to be a great saint for the purpose of being a great saint. The saint's goal is to get as close to God as they can, not for their own sake, but for his sake. The aim is to give honor and glory to God and to totally forget the self. Mother's perpetual calendar features an inspirational message for each day of the year. It's available at EWTNRC.com. Hi, we're Greg and Jennifer Willits, founders of RosaryArmy.com. Some people struggle to understand the Holy Spirit in their lives. I know that there's been a time for me where that's been the case. A great way to enhance your relationship with the Holy Spirit is by meditating on the mysteries of the Rosary where the Holy Spirit is very clearly in action. This was a benefit in my own prayer life. For example, by meditating on the descent of the Holy Spirit, which is the third glorious mystery, and the Annunciation, which is the first joyful mystery, we can learn to be more attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. The Rosary can help teach us to discern the promptings of the Spirit and to be more open to the guidance of God in our prayer. Join us at rosaryarmy.com to learn more about how the rosary can be a powerful tool for deepening your relationship with the Holy Spirit. The rosary is not just a traditional devotion. It's a powerful tool for growing closer to God. For more information about the rosary, visit rosaryarmy.com. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Got a great new item in EWTN's religious catalog. It's called Saint Stamps. It's a giant floor puzzle. It's 36 inches by 24 inches. You can introduce your children to holy friends from around the world. 28 different saints on this All Saints Day from 22 countries come together in this giant-sized puzzle. 48 large and sturdy pieces are perfect for little hands to play with as they help kids understand the concept of God's boundless love for all people. Puzzles are a great way to start conversations with your children, asking them questions about the things they see. They promote problem-solving skills and eye-hand coordination. These puzzles are made in the United States and are recommended for ages 3 and up. It's available now at EWTNRC.com where they're offering free standard shipping on online orders of $75 or more. That is standard shipping in the continental U.S. only. Use the code FREE at checkout. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. You wanted to wrap up your last... uh... Yeah, I I did want to say this too um, because there's quite a bit of confusion that is very evil uh, right now. uh, And we're seeing, uh, you know, truly evil things of encouraging attacks on Jewish students at universities, at the elite universities, and this is uh, ab- uh, you know absolute uh, evil itself, and you know um, and even uh, the man in charge of the FBI, Christopher Ray, the the director of FBI, has said that though Jews are only just a little over 2% of the population, 60% of religiously motive, uh, uh, motivated attacks are against Jews. All of us as Catholics should be very alert to keeping an eye out for such anti-Jewish uh, sentiment and uh, 
do what we can to speak against it, stop it if we know of something happening, and, you know, make sure that we assure Jewish people of uh, their, our support. I even would add this. Ask your, if you have kids in high school, ask the school counselors to question any of the universities that want to interview your students. Find out from them, do you keep the Jewish students safe? Do you keep the Christians and the Muslims safe too? But right now, the Jewish students, if they don't, then what I would ask your schools to do is prohibit those schools from coming to your high school campus and recruiting students until they can guarantee that they will do everything they can to keep all students safe. We've had problems with safety of students during the civil rights era, and now we have this against Jewish students. I think all of the Catholic schools ought to make a very clear stance that we will not allow places like Cornell and Columbia that refuse or don't take the proper steps to protect their Jewish students, because if they don't protect the Jewish students now, you can be sure they won't protect other people later on. If they're cowards, don't let your students go there. It's, you know, or, or you can't stop that, but you can't let them come to your campus. That would be one thing. Finally, I would just say this, too, about the original question regarding um, the uh, Hamas. Are they culpable? This is a very important teaching moment. Does not Hamas object when their own citizens are hit by a bomb, when, when, a, when Israelis bomb the Hamas installations and then civilians die, do they not object? Yes. And they bring this to the world, and we see protests all over the world. Well, the fact that they know that innocent civilians, non-combatant civilians— should not be harmed, then on that principle, I don't want you to do this to my people, then you don't do it to other people. You know it's wrong to harm non-combatants. Then you are morally culpable before God and the world for harming non-combatants, as Hamas did and bragged about on October 7th. This is something where we have to have great moral clarity and, you know, that they are fully responsible. They know it's wrong, even though they have another motive, that that never does the end justify an evil means. In a relativistic world, it does. And that's why you have people justifying what Hamas did. Shame on that Cornell professor that was exhilarated by the death of innocent children. Shame on him and on anybody who supports that kind of thing. We have to have a proper sense of moral thinking. Are there problems between Israel and Palestine? Yes. Are they going to be solved by this? No. Many more Palestinians are going to tragically die because of the imbalance of power. That's, that's a reality. I'm not saying what should or shouldn't be. That's the reality. And many Israelis, many more Israelis are going to die. This all has to stop. PJ is in the great state of Florida listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. PJ, you're on with Father Mitch. Boy, I'll tell you, Father Mitch, I couldn't agree with you more. I just add one thing to your commentary there, sure. and that is all of those alumni – of all of those schools that they donate year after year after year, thousands, hundred thousands, 
put that checkbook away. Don't ever send them another dime until all of these people who are anti-Semitic and are, and are attacking Jewish kids, until they are purged from the ranks of the professors or the, the, the leadership of these universities, not another dime. I would so, say, I would just add this, switch your funds and let the universities know I'm giving my funds to a Jewish university or this yeshiva. <laughs> That'll love fix it. their I wagons. Love I love anyway. it. All right, so let me, let, let me get to my question. Sure. I'm sorry. If you, I, want, I want to go back maybe five minutes. You know, I, I was listening to you, and it brought up a question I don't think I've ever heard uh, the answer to before, and that is, what is the Catholic Church's position on hauntings, ghosts, specters, and whatnot? Because I, 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 in poltergeists and that type of thing, mm -hmm. because I seem to remember the Conjuring movies were stories um, that were that were created by uh, Lorraine. Uh, what was her name? Can't think. She's dead now. But she was a very famous Catholic. Um, that and she like Amy Deville horror, The Conjuring. All of these stories were her trying to um, wield the good against the evil. But I'd never heard what the Catholic position is on ghosts and and um, specters and, and, and poltergeists and all sure. of these things. And and then last but not least, what are they? If the, if the Catholic Church says, yes, ghosts are real, what are they? Okay, a couple things. First, our teaching is that the spirit of a dead person, when a person dies, their spirit stands before the judgment seat of Christ— and they are judged as either condemned to hell or redeemed. Even among the redeemed who need purification, you know, purgatory, they go immediately to purgatory. They don't hang around. So we don't, uh, and uh, one of the other things too, sacred scripture and church teaching are 100% clear that any kind of attempt to contact these spirits through Ouija boards or any other uh, uh, seances, all that stuff is a mortal sin against the first commandment, that you may not do that. What uh, the, the church does not speculate officially as to what they are, but many within the church would uh, uh, hold that these are um, uh, you know, demonic apparitions, imitations of human beings, and uh, as well as, in the vast majority of cases, fraud. There are, you know, I studied the history of spiritism and seances, and the admission of fraud— or, in the case of some, the discovery of fraud has caused so much havoc, uh, it especially is something that arises after wars. So after the Civil War, after World War I, World War II, there was a, a whole spate of this, and there were people that took advantage of the bereaved. People didn't get a chance to say goodbye to a soldier who died in some battle uh, field. And so they wanted to have a chance to say goodbye to him. And these frauds, and again, that the majority of it is fraud. Uh, but there are times when, uh, you know, it may well be that there's something spiritual going on, but it would be something from the evil side imitating other people, just as these frauds imitate. And uh, uh, the, the stories of this, uh, when you had uh, people doing seances, inviting Nobel Prize winning scientists to investigate, that was such a rope-a-dope, and I do mean dope, uh, uh, situation because scientists are naive, are, are skeptical of spiritual life, but they are naive about the evidence. They assume goodwill. The best ones to ever discover the frauds 
were professional sleight of hand magicians. They knew all the tricks and they found them out every time. Uh, and so that's that would be the majority of cases fraud, but in some cases it may be something demonic and you uh, can certainly pray against those spirits and in some cases you may need to have an exorcism. Does that help? Yes, sir. Very much so. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. Thank you, PJ. We appreciate the phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. One open line at 833-288-3986. It's EWTN's Open Line Wednesday <laughs> with Father Mitch Pacwa. <laughs> Are you prepared to vote? The Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1706, says, By his reason, man recognizes the voice of God, which urges him to do what is good and avoid what is evil. Everyone is obliged to follow this law. Learn more so you're prepared when you vote this November. Visit EWTN.com slash vote for everything Catholic voters need to know before picking up a ballot. Journey deeper in your understanding of the Eucharistic mystery and the Eucharistic story of God's love for us. Download the free ebook, The Twelve Stations of the Most Holy Eucharist, at EWTN.com slash Catholicism. This is Father Robert Nixon here from New Norcia Abbey in Western Australia. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray, Lord that you can help us to put an end to the horrendous scourge of abortion which is plaguing our world today, the heartless murder of countless innocent unborn children. We pray to your blessed mother that she give us the grace, the love, the compassion to realize the horror of this thing. We pray to our Holy Father that he lend his fortitude and wisdom to our leaders, to be courageous, to stand up for human dignity, to end this unspeakable crime. We make this prayer in the holy name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you have a clean joke to share with the world? We'd love for you to share yours tomorrow on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie on most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Open Line with Father Mitch Pacwa. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Congratulations going out to another member of the EWTN Radio family. Eternal Life Radio in Fitchburg and Shirley, Massachusetts is celebrating their 11th year with EWTN. Big old congratulations to you, Marianne Harold, and your whole team. WQPH 89.3 from all your friends here at EWTN Radio. One open line at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Tom is next up, a first-time caller in the great state of Oklahoma. He is listening on Oklahoma Catholic Broadcasting. Tom, you're on with Father Mitch. Well, hi, Father Mitch. Uh, I was uh, my, my question is about uh, Israel and the, uh, the geography of Israel. Mm-hmm. Sure. It, it, it seems to me that, uh, uh, based on reading the Bible and, uh, and following along as best I can, is that uh, uh, Israel is located in a certain piece of geography that was, at biblical times, at the time it was chosen as the promised land, was occupied. I was just wondering, uh, I, you know, God's perfect and he makes no mistakes. I was just trying to understand better why God would pick a land that was already occupied to be the promised land versus giving them a... A, a piece of land that nobody was on at the time. Yeah, a couple things. First of all, uh, let, me, let me just say uh, uh, about that part, about them already being occupied. In De- Read Deuteronomy 7, and you see there that the people who had been living in the land were to be 
removed not because Israel was so good, but because they were so bad. They, the, the people of the land of Canaan, had the, the, uh, their religion had changed quite a bit from the time of Abraham. And they had moved into a combination of orgiastic worship. They, they, their two gods, um, the god of the storm, Baal, and his sister Anat, representing the earth, were the two fertility gods. And they would have orgies in order to get them excited enough to have relations and give birth from the earth, uh, you know, with the crops and such. Secondly, they were doing human sacrifice, uh, sacrificing their own children, especially babies. And for those two, plus a variety of other things, including from the last call, uh, you know, the occult, necromancy, seances, things like that, having familiar spirits, uh, all of those sins were so grave. And they, uh, as a matter of fact, it talks in one passage about how they had finally filled up their measure of sin and God had had it. So that's why they're being removed. That's one part of your question. Secondly, the land itself is extremely important. This, the, the, there's, there's no gold there. Only in the far, far south was there some copper and, you know, a semi-precious stone that uh, comes from that. Today it's called a lot stone. Um, uh, and there are some fertile valleys. Jezreel Valley is very fertile. The coastal plain is fertile. But, and you can grow good grapes and olives on the hills. But it's not, the, you know, the, it, it's certainly not producing on the level of Kansas or Illinois or these other states like Indiana. Um, it's not the richest place. What it does have that is key for its choice as the promised land is that there are two roads. One of them is the King's Highway that goes through Amman, Jordan, down to Petra, and then over to, towards uh, Aqaba, and then uh, to Arabia and to Egypt. And then there's another road along the coast. Both of those roads have been used for travel and trade for the last 11,000 years. And they are the only two roads that connect Africa, Asia, and Europe. That That is the one small strip of land in between the sea and the eastern desert that people can traverse on the only two roads and go to the three continents of the old world. And so if you are primarily calling a people with a message rather than calling a big army with weapons, then this is the most ideal location. From that one area you could reach the whole of the ancient world. And that's why it was such an important choice. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I, I was just going mainly from the part of uh, also uh, why it seems like part of the uh, conflict today is because of the over, over, that, over the land as mm -hmm. well as the religious conflict. And I was just curious why he didn't select a place that, that was... Sure. <laughs> well, see, it's, it's great for travel. Now, this present conflict, and this is something important to keep in mind, the present conflict did not begin in ancient times. A lot of people try to say, well, they've been fighting over there for thousands of years. Jews and Arabs have not been fighting for thousands of years. Over there, they've been fighting for the last 
96 years. And a good deal of that, of the present day fight, goes uh, to the end of imperialism. The British Empire was fighting against the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And eventually the, they destroyed the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And the British wanted land routes through the Middle East to India. And, of course, they wanted oil in that area, especially in Iraq. Um, and this fight goes back to the British telling the Palestinian Arabs, if you help us fight the Turks, we'll give you your own country. They also went to David Ben-Gurion and the Jewish settlers who had started coming there in the 1880s and said, if you help us fight the Turks and help us get America involved in World War I, then we'll give you a country. That was called the Balfour Agreement. And the problem is, it was the same country that they promised to both groups. When the two groups found out in 1927 that they had both been promised a country, but it was the same piece of land, that's when the fight began between the Israelis and the Palestinian Arabs. That's when that got started. The reason that that's important, because it, it gets, you know, look in the history and you see it gets mixed up with Arab nationalism and Jewish nationalism. Both of those are involved. It's less about religion than nationalistic aspirations that were on the rise after, during and after the war. In fact, going back to the French Revolution, that's where it started for nationalistic aspirations. Key, the reason it's important to remember all that and try to learn about it is that if such a war went on for thousands and thousands of years, there's no ending it. But if it did, in fact, have a specific historical beginning due to a specific historical situation, then you can start to say, what do we do to help remedy the situation? If it's thousands of years, I give up. I can't fix it. But if it started just 96 years ago, let's see what we can do and fix it. And that's very important for both sides. Next up is Mary in the great state of Vermont watching us on YouTube today. Mary, you're on with Father Mitch. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, Father Mitch. Hi. Um, such a joy to speak with you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for your knowledge, and I pray for you every day. I, I need that. Thank you. You're, you're so very welcome. Father, I just need your idea and take on having the American flag on the altar. When I'm down south, not directly in the sanctuary, but... As you walk into the church and you look to the left of the sanctuary, the, the American flag is there. Up north here, I, I went to church this morning, and the flag isn't there anymore. So can I just have your view on that, please? It's, it's sure, pretty. sure. One, here's one of the issues behind that. Catholics have been treated historically as suspect in their allegiance to the United States. There was always this suspicion that we will be more allied with the Pope than with the country. And back in the early the churches up in the sanctuaries, I think, especially since the, the 60s were over and all that, the loyalty of Catholics to the country is no longer suspect. You have a lot of folks, especially on the political left, who still dislike Catholics because of our stance on morality. But they don't doubt that we're loyal Americans. So a lot of pastors don't put a flag in there. There's nothing in church law requiring it or forbidding it. Um, I think it was just a, a way to show any visitors that we are committed to our country and we're loyal American citizens. That's what I think was going on. Does that help? 
that helps a lot. I just, uh, you know, with the line, one nation under God, and yeah. I, it, that, it, that just um, really... No, that's a me, Catholic you know? line. That was put in there by the Knights, Knights of, of Columbus. Columbus. Yep. And uh, it wasn't in the original Pledge of Allegiance, but they got it put in there in the early 1950s, and that was especially helpful then because there was a big scare about communism. Now that we see their back, uh, to, to use a phrase from a movie about the hauntings, uh, the, the haunting specter of communism is re-arising on the goofy left. God bless you. We appreciate the phone call. Lisa's in San Antonio, Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Lisa, how are things in the Republic? Pretty good. Pretty hot. It's hot? Yeah. It was 31 here in Birmingham this morning. <laughs> well, it was a little cool for us, but not anything like that, no. Yep, yep. So what can we do for you? Yes, sir. I have a question, Father. Um, I, I've i heard different things about this, and I'm not real sure if, it's, if this is true or not, so I was calling. Mm-hmm. I'd love to know, when you go to confession with a priest, and you go in there, if someone was to go in there and confess to a rape, murder, they molested somebody, mm-hmm. they kidnapped someone, those obviously are legal no-nos. I mean, you, they're against the law. Yep, my Th- those are capital is, crimes in some states. Yes, they are. And so my question is, if someone goes in there, are they, as soon as they leave the box there, the confessional, is the priest obligated legally Morally, I don't know, to go to the authorities and notify that this person just told me they murdered someone. Nope. Or they he may raped not, someone. He may not do that. I thought maybe it was a state thing or no, a state no, state no, or no. just the cross the board priests all over nope. have the same moral code on that. Same moral code. Uh, they have to put us in prison or even execute us. As many priests uh, in the past have been executed. St. John Nep- Nepomucene is a good example of uh, a priest that was executed because he would not break the seal. And others have been arrested and put in prison, but we may not reveal it. If we did that, no murderer would confess his sins. And so our approach is the police have to to use their wits to figure out who did the crime. My job is to talk to this person and you know in, in, in the the case they come I assume that when somebody comes to confession it's not always true but 99.999% of the time it's true. They're sorry for the sin. And, you know, it's to help them sin no more. I may not even tell them, you must go and turn yourself into the police. I can't tell them that. The police have to figure out their job. My task is to help that person find reconciliation. Now, uh, with a serious crime like that, uh, I wouldn't expect a priest to give all five fathers and five Hail Marys going away in peace. No, I would call somebody to a serious penitential act because those are grave crimes. But I cannot turn them in and I cannot tell them to turn themselves in. What I do... would say to a person in such a case, if you uh, if they tell me that they are going to turn themselves in, I would go to the police with them. I, I would accompany them if they wanted me to, but I would not tell them to do so nor turn them in. Does that make sense? Yeah, she's gone now, but oh. I think that that's a clear answer to the question. Um, our good buddy Steve Ray can't go to Israel with everything going on there, so he came here to see you instead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure so, which is more dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it's me or Hamas. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. He's, he's, he's actually here because he wrote a good book on the book of Genesis. 
So he's got a commentary on Genesis, a very helpful one, and it's got a lot of good uh, material in there. And that's uh, tonight on EWTN Live, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio and Television. David is in Illinois watching on YouTube today. David, you're on with Father Mitch. Hey, Father. Yes, about the consecration, mm-hmm. if if the priest says the words of consecration for the bread wrong, he says this is the body, but he says the words of consecration for the wine correctly, what part of Mass or the consecration is invalid? He says this is the body? Yes. Well, I was at Mass. I think the priest made a mistake. Okay. He didn't do that to make any kind of statement. Oh, he made a little that's, mistake. That, that's a first point. Um, you know, in, in, because it's not something deliberate, um, you know, uh, I would say in that kind of case uh, that uh, I don't think that would make it invalid. He, he wasn't, you know, I, I think this would be... Uh, you know the the kind of slip of a, the the tongue that he said the instead of my, um, and he didn't mean to make a theological error. Um, I I you know there's another principle called ecclesia suplet that the church will supply what is missing there because the intention is correct um, and not heretical. Had he done that intentionally, because he did not want himself to, he didn't want to say, this is my body, and didn't want to identify that way with Christ uh, and act in persona Christi. If, he, if that was on his mind, then it would be invalid. But I think because that, it, what you're saying, it's not on his mind, then I, I would say that the church would supply the, what's missing there. Does that help? Yeah, I'm glad I called. I did have another question, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> that I cannot help you with. You may need to talk to that priest about the memory program. <laughs> God bless you, David. Thanks for the phone call. Cynthia is up next. She's in the great state of Michigan listening on the Ave Maria radio app. Cynthia, you're on with Father Mitch. All right. Hi, Father Mitch. Appreciate you. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Um, so uh, just a quick question, um, referring back to a previous caller um, sure. about, um, you know, hauntings and stances and mm-hmm. bringing back people from the dead and that sort of thing. So can you just speak briefly then to um, when Saul um, went to visit a witch to have, I believe it was Samuel, mm-hmm. kind of like. I don't know if I want to say resurrected or... But, well, yeah. that he would call <laughs> forth his spirit. And, you know, Saul, you know, went to the witch, which was a major sin. That was a death penalty sin. And, in fact, Saul had enforced the death penalty in other cases. But he was so desperate to find out whether or not he would win or lose the battle against the Philistines, that he went against the, the scriptural law and against his own legislation and practice. And he uh, sought out the witch of Endor. And so, you know, this uh, uh, for that, he was con- condemned and, you know, Apparently, the prophet Samuel did appear to him, uh, but said, uh, you will join me. I won't join you. So that's that puts the end of that. And as when you read on there, you see that King Saul did die in the battle. And there was an element of an one more sin brought in to make it even worse, he committed suicide uh, during the battle because he didn't want to be captured by the Philistines, so he added to it by committing suicide, and that made the sin even worse. 
So there's there's nothing good about that circumstance. It's one level of disobedience after another. And it ended very badly, and he lost control of the kingdom. Um, the son that came after him was not able to maintain the kingdom, and he was assassinated also. And eventually David, whom Saul had tried to kill, David took over the whole kingdom after Saul, and that was the end of Saul's line. How's that, Cynthia? What? And I'm sorry, where would Samuel, where would his spirit have, have been called forth from? Would it, it have would been have purgatory been in, or heaven? Well, well it would have been, uh, we would call it purgatory. They, they called it Sheol, the, this place of the dead that wasn't heaven, wasn't hell. It was uh, just the place of the dead. And they usually spoke about somebody's shadow being there. They, they, they talked about the shade of a person. Just, it's very much the way the Greeks talked about shades inhabiting Hades. If you um, uh, ever get, a, uh, have you ever read the Iliad or the Odyssey? Um, I wish I could say yes. My kids have, but I haven't. <laughs> okay, well, get your kids to read it to you. And it's a good, it's a great classic of Western history. Uh, Western literature, but in there you see every so often that the shades of the dead go to Hades. Hades and Sheol are about the same. Again, it's not heaven, and it's not hell as a place of punishment, but it's this state in between. And that's, by the way, why Christ in First Peter chapter three, verse uh, twenty and twenty-one goes down and preaches to those souls so that then after his death and resurrection, he can take them up to heaven. That's the basis for the line in the Apostles' Creed, he descended to hell. That was the Hades or Sheol that he's talking about there. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? Yep. Lord, bless you all and keep you the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Mitch Pacwa, our producer, Michael McCall, our call screener, Matt Kubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Wednesday. Back at it tomorrow on Open Line Thursday with Dominican Father Brian Milady. Until we get together then, God bless. God bless.